thank you. Um, that is a hard act to follow. Um, I think the only thing I can really say is I think I tuned into the channel of hope this morning also, and I'm going to try to share that. Um, I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about how we are going to reverse the obesity epidemic and create health, not just spend ever more money on health care. And I'm going to apologize in advance because the beginning of the talk is kind of a downer. But I promise you, it's going to get better. Um, I promise you that I believe we will reverse this epidemic, um, and I'm going to tell you how. So without further ado, let's jump right into the downer portion. We still occasionally hear a politician bray that America has the best health care system in the world. But everybody knows that's nonsense. Our health care system is a mess. And people generally agree on two root causes of this mess. First, our system is organized and paid for in a way that promotes complexity and high cost and disfavors coordination of care and efficiency. Medical experts all agree that at least one third of medical spending and activities is either useless or actively harmful to the patients. And we spend a lot of money on this. That one third is a huge problem, but it's not the problem that I'm going to talk to you about today. The second root cause is how we live. The lifestyle that we have developed in this country over the last several decades produces illnesses, particularly chronic illnesses, on which the great majority of activity and spending in the medical system is uh, expended. 70% um, of dollars in healthcare go to take care of chronic diseases that are the result of our lifestyle. And this is a big problem. What it means is that the overwhelming amount of passion and training and expertise of our doctors, the great technology of our hospitals, goes to taking care of issues that are the result of this, you know, the underlying part of this giant iceberg of a collapsing public health <coughs> status in the country. Now, nothing I've said really is controversial. Everybody agrees that doctors spend most of their time treating chronic illness, that chronic illness results from lifestyle, that it's not being cured and not being dealt with. The problem is how we live when we're not in the doctor's office. We eat and drink way too much. We don't move around enough. And we channel way too much stress in our daily lives. We don't all get up and tune into the right radio station, I guess I should say. And it's getting worse. This is the discouraging downer part. It's really getting worse. 30% of kids who were born in the year 2000 are expected to develop diabetes in the course of their lifetime. Right now, one third of Medicare dollars are spent treating diabetics. And by 2050, if current trends continue, fully a third of the US population, three times the current rate, will have diabetes. And that is a financial disaster for the country. And it's not just about money to continue to pick on diabetes. This is a terrible disease. Kids who get diabetes before they turn 18 are expected to live statistically to age 57. And on the way, their feet are likely to be amputated, and they will go blind. This is a terrible, terrible problem. And finally, it's not just about money. It's not just about compassion and suffering. It's about national security. Today, 27% of Americans of military age are too obese to serve in the Army. That is a higher percent of disqualification because of malnutrition than we found at the beginning of World War II when 25% of Americans who were drafted failed to qualify because they were underfed. Today, 27% don't qualify because they're obese. So um, this is a big, big problem. It's not ambiguous. Our farmers, our restaurateurs, and our grocers are killing us. And they're killing us with our wholehearted cooperation and enthusiastic participation and greatly to the benefit of the medical industry. The fact that 
the food industry doesn't mean to kill us, doesn't want to kill us, that we don't want to commit suicide by lifestyle, and that our doctors don't want to profiteer off of this madness really doesn't matter. We have got to get at the base of this iceberg. I told you it was going to be a downer, and that's the end of the downer portion. All right? The good news is we can and we will solve this problem and create a healthy America again. I am confident that we are not going to hit this iceberg. The reason I'm confident is because we're on the verge of a technology boom that will enable us to change our relationship with food and the other producers of health or ill health. Now, usually when we think about technology in the context of medical care and health care, we think about devices like the miraculous artificial heart in the picture or cancer cures developed in wet labs by biochemists and things like that. Increasingly, we're realizing that information technology is also part of curing the ills of the medical system. Mobile devices like the iPad and the iPhone are incredibly important, and the great diagnostic breakthroughs are wonderful. All of this stuff is incredibly important for getting after that one-third of the dollars that are wasted or harmful to us. And I love this stuff. I'm not saying anything against this. This is a big part of my life. But this stuff will not help us avoid hitting the iceberg. To avoid the iceberg, we have to change our food culture. And to change our food culture, we need a different technology. And it's coming. What is coming I refer to as lean technology. That is, tools and solutions that help us fuel our bodies to create health. That's what I mean by lean technology. Lean technology is already emerging. It's all around us, and it's the kind of things that are disrupting other industries. And it can radically disrupt the way we create our health or sickness. Its potential is limited only by our own creativity and our courage. So let me tell you what I mean by it. I'll give you four examples of lean technology. The first is the humble smartphone that probably everyone in this room has on their, per on their person at this moment. For this purpose, the reason the smartphone is a miracle platform technology is because it enables innovators in lean tech to distribute solutions and tools at zero incremental cost. You've already paid for the platform and you're carrying it around. The second important building block of lean technology is big data. Big data is the connection of all these formerly dif uh, disparate databases that um, enables things today like the miraculous logistics at UPS or the refinement of digital advertising to present you offers that you're more likely to want, the Groupon that is more to your liking rather than something that you're not interested in. This has been very slow to come to healthcare because a lot of our data has been held in paper files in the doctor's office. But as the data gets digitized, it's beginning to aggregate, and the ana analytics of healthcare data is really just beginning. The correlations and knowledge that are going to come out of that is important. The third, what I'm calling lean technology building block, is behavioral economics. Behavioral economics really is the study of how we make decisions, why we behave the way we make. We used to think we were all rational and we weighed cost and benefit and then did what was to our best interest. Obviously, that's not true. We're driven by emotion. We're driven by social factors. Behavioral economics is really about being able to predict what will influence us to change our behavior, which is very important when we think about the food culture and how to change it. And then last is um, what are called incentive platforms that are being developed by health insurance companies at a furious pace and deployed as we speak. Now, I'll explain how these work in a second. Humana's behavioral, I'm sorry, Humana's incentive platform um, is called Vitality. All the other big carriers are working on them. And they're working on them like mad because health reform killed the traditional model of health insurance. The companies, and these are big, powerful companies, have got to do something different. And what they're trying to do is work on creating health rather than managing risk. So let me try to tie these together with an example for you. 
One of the reasons why we eat so much unhealthy food is because it's cheaper. It's cheaper in both dollar terms and time terms. And, you know, that's interesting because eating healthy food, no matter what it costs, is a whole lot cheaper than getting diabetes or heart disease. The problem is the costs are mismatched in time and they're paid by different entities, different people, people at different stages in their life. The magic of these incentive platforms is they enable the insurance company or your employer or the government through Medicare or Medicaid, whoever owns the responsibility of paying for your medical bills to change the price of calories at the time you choose to eat them. So for example, you're in the grocery store and you look at this wonderful array of vegetables and you think, huh, those are beautiful, but um, they're too expensive. And anyway, I don't have time to cook them. Maybe it would change your perception of that and your decision if you received a coupon through the smartphone that you have on you that you wave at the checkout counter. Remember, the smartphone knows where you are at all times. It knows you're in the fresh produce aisle. Um, and you get a coupon that says, big discount on fresh produce and whole grains. Or maybe they're actually free, courtesy of a subsidy from your insurance company. Or maybe they're better than free. Maybe you get frequent flyer miles in addition to their free. I mean, you could easily pay for all of that if you could avoid the downstream costs of all these chronic illnesses. Um, all of that will rest on big data, the ability to measure what's going on and link activity to predicted outcomes. All of it will depend on intelligent, creative application of behavioral, behavioral economic theories, positive psychology, the social sciences like that. Because for example, maybe I don't really care what the vegetables cost, um, but I might be really motivated by a um, game with my Facebook friends to see who can have the healthiest shopping cart. Um, or maybe you don't really care about the, uh, you're not really the kind of person for whom negative incentives are very strong, but you would like very much to get digital badges um, or digital roses or something like that, that um, again, will show up in your social networking so that, you know, the point is there, we're all different. We don't respond to the same things. Brute force is not gonna change, um, you know, how we live. We've gotta have a nuanced message. That's an example of how those things fit together. And it may seem big brotherish. It may also seem a little bit otherworldly, but it is happening right now. The number of business plans that my venture capital firm receives every week about how to take advantage of these building blocks and to create tools that explain health to people, that bring the future consequences of their decisions to them today is enormous. And it's um, driven by the fact that the problem of the obesity epidemic is a giant economic opportunity if we can figure out how to cure it. If we could cut 10% of chronic illness, we would save about $200 billion out of that two and a half trillion. And if you could make just a little bit of profit margin on that savings, you would create new wealth in the society of hundreds of billions of dollars. And just to put this in context, $200 billion is approximately the market cap of Google. It's twice the market cap of McDonald's. Um, it's more than the entire cost of the space shuttle program over 30 years. This is a big number. This is a big opportunity. And there are a lot of innovators and entrepreneurs coming at this. Now, I'm not naive. I know that lean technology and entrepreneurship alone are not going to change society, are not going to change our relationship with something as fundamental as food. We also need innovation in policy, in law, and in culture. But another reason why I'm tuned into the channel of hope is because that's happening. The first lady really gets the most credit here. Her campaign against childhood obesity, it may work, it may not work, but it's given us language and permission to talk about this as a health issue, rather than an issue of you know, yelling at each other about what our bodies look like, an aesthetic problem. And for that, I think she deserves great praise. Um, the other thing that makes me optimistic is we have beaten back a pernicious agribusiness that sprang out of you know, good roots of giving comfort. 
back in the early days of its existence. And by that, of course, I'm talking about smoking. The tobacco wars have given us a playbook. We know that we need to educate the public, and it takes a long time, and it requires a lot of creativity. We know that we need to tax things that we want to ingest less of. We know that we need to regulate harmful products to keep them away from children. It strikes me as ridiculous that we don't allow kids to buy cigarettes, which might give them lung cancer and shorten their lives by, what, five, six years on average? But we do let them buy sugary sodas that will give them diabetes and cause them to die at age 57 with their feet cut off. There's a lot to do here. The toolkit needs to be applied. And it is beginning to be applied. So that's all very hopeful. The other thing that needs to come into the picture is we need to change the way the medical industry approaches this issue. Today we have an unvirtuous circle where hospitals and doctors, specialists, make an enormous amount of money by treating these diseases of affluence. Um, and not surprisingly, they're very skeptical that they can ever be changed, that the way we can eat, the way we eat will ever be changed. In my experience, you gotta get the brilliance of the medical profession behind any kind of health-related social change. The MD, in my introduction, by the way, does not refer to doctor. It's a managing director of a venture, venture capital firm. So, you know, wh why listen to me about all this? We've got to get the medical profession and the hospitals into this game. To do that, we have to change reimbursement tools. Doctors don't get paid anything for keeping us healthy today. They get paid for treating illness, for doing procedures. And, you know, to change this dynamic, we need to pay more for what we want more of, which is health, and less for what we want less of, which are procedures, you know, on hearts and hips and all that stuff. Um, so cutting reimbursement on procedures for people with very high BMIs and redeploying those dollars into medically supervised weight loss and health creation seems to be an area where we need some real policy innovation. And I think it will come. The health reform bill has a lot of initiatives around pay for performance that set this up very nicely. So that's the toolkit. We've got the technologies, the lean technologies. We have an understanding of the problem today that is emerging. And I think we're beginning to have a sense of urgency. The lack of soldiers, the lack of workers, all of these things um, are really getting our attention. We can do this. And I'm confident that we will do this. And if you'll forgive the sentimentality, I'm confident because this is very much in what I think of as the spirit of who we are as a people. This republic was created to enable us to have life, liberty, and to pursue happiness. And chronic disease takes life away early from millions of our citizens. Chronic disease greatly diminishes the liberty of people who are tethered to the insane medical system with all the pain and all the frustration that goes with that. And chronic illness radically reduces the ability to pursue happiness. It takes away money, it takes away time, and it creates pain. I'm confident that we can do this. And I know we will because we've done it before with the other essential fuel that our bodies need. And by that, of course, I'm talking about water. Clean water is the miracle of the developed world. Clean water got rid of um, all kinds of chronic intestinal diseases that crippled whole societies, that caused the you know, average lifespan to be in the 40s, that made armies unable to take the field. And clean water has been engineered into our lives so completely that we don't even think about it. We take it entirely for granted. And we give it away free everywhere, in water fountains, in parks, outside this room. Everywhere we go, we don't even think about water. We can engineer healthy food into our lives just as completely. And to do so should be our highest health priority. Thank you.